think we should go ahead and get started. Hopefully, Eric will be able to join us here soon. Um, I had not heard that he's having issues logging in, so hopefully he's just maybe running a little bit late. Um, so thank you to all of our attendees for joining us for this uh, global health career session. And obviously, thank you to our uh, panelists as well. Um, let's see. Okay, apologies. Um, uh, so we are going to um, do this really as a, you know, sort of an informal Q&A today. I have a few questions. I think I'll let the panelists introduce themselves rather than me uh, reading their bios. And then we'll go ahead and open up the, uh, this discussion to the audience, um, whatever questions you might like to ask. Um, so I will start off with a few questions so that they can introduce themselves. Like I said, um, as we're talking, if anybody has any questions, please drop those into the Q&A um, so we can really make this as um, engaging a discussion as possible. Uh, so to start off with, um, would each of you maybe tell us just what your current position is or what and what your primary responsibilities are that you're working on right now? Um, well, I guess I can begin. Uh, I'm Mary Harvey and um, I'm a retired civil servant and Foreign Service Officer with the United States Agency for International Development. I've worked with them for 26 years in the Africa Bureau. And then before I retired, my last four years were in Ethiopia, focusing on, on, on nutrition. Currently in retirement, I'm now doing consulting for USAID and I'm this acting senior health team lead for the US, USAID mission in Burundi. Over. Uh, okay, I'll go next. Um, so my name is uh, Maha Damaj. I am the country representative of UNICEF to the Republic of Moldova. Uh, as a representative, I'm basically the person responsible for UNICEF um, uh, in front of the government and, uh, and responsible for leading the the program direction, strategy, vision, and implementation uh, for children in Moldova. Well, hello. Uh, my name is Alfredo Vergara. I, um, I live in Mozambique currently. Um, I work for the Centers for Disease Control. Um, I have been working for the Centers for Disease Control for about 20 years now. And um, I direct the office uh, of the CDC here in Mozambique. I don't know if uh, any of you know, but the CDC does have offices around the world in, in a few countries. Um, here we have uh, primarily a focus on HIV uh, and HIV prevention. So the President uh, Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR. And um, so we have a, a rather large office here in Mozambique because Mozambique is one of the countries that is sort of most behind, let's say, in controlling the HIV epidemic. Um, we it's uh, 90 plus uh, employees and, and we get about 180 million per year for uh, for HIV uh, control here in Mozambique. Over. Perfect. So what made each of you want to work in a global setting or with communities maybe outside of the one that you grew up in? Uh, I guess um, I grew up in Chicago or in a suburb, Northwest suburb near O'Hare Airport. And just even from a young age, I like to go out to O'Hare, see the planes leave and wonder where everyone was going and wonder when can I leave and get taken with. So I've always had an interest in um, other cultures and in getting to know them and doing public service, I guess. And so, uh, I, in growing up, I used to do volunteer work on the south side of Chicago with, with children. And so combining the interest of global travel, children, child's health, education, led me into um, following my heart and I guess learning French and <laughs> getting a degree from Iowa in French, which, and in African studies. And that led me to the Peace Corps. And then that was the continuation of my public health um, services. I got my MPH from the University of Illinois at Chicago Circle prior, many years before um, Iowa. And I'm so pleased to see that Iowa now has a school of public health and it's just great to um, meet everybody. But that's basically um, 
it's just been following um, my passions and um, with persistence. Over. Okay, um, I guess we'll follow the same order. <laughs> so, um, you know, I kind of struggled with this question because I, I I've been global all my life. Um, uh, as a child of, um, well, I don't want to say as a child of war, but basically as as a as a Lebanese, you know, we're we're, we're diaspora is our is our middle name, and so I grew up outside of Lebanon from the start, um, and I've been probably a third culture kid all my life. Um, I think the I, I did the, the the bulk of my career, the bulk of my professional experience. I mean, the was actually in Lebanon. I did go back after to do my um, masters. I was gonna say a little known fact. I'm actually a biomedical engineer from Hopkins, and I did my masters in public health in the American University of Beirut, which brought, brought me back to Lebanon and where I found myself doing development and loving it, uh, basically finding myself in it. Um, but I think. I, like I said, I, I kind of struggled with this because it, I never thought I would only stay in Lebanon and I never thought I, you know, I never thought I wouldn't be working everywhere. But I have to confess that when I did finally move, um, there were two, two, there were two kind of um, pulls. One of them was, um, and we'll come to this again and again, was disillusionment that you know that I I had reached somewhere in the work that I was doing in Lebanon on child protection. I would reach the point where there was. There was a, there wasn't more I could push, or I had lost I had lost steam for for pushing more, and I needed um I needed to move I needed to be somewhere else and learn learn from a different um, experience. So it was it was um and there was like this nerdy pull almost like I wonder how things are done somewhere else. Or I wonder how how what can be done differently and and how to how to actually do things a little differently in another country. Um, but when I when I, that switch happened, I also, I was a national officer and I was becoming an international. It was also that I kind of wanted to redeem internationals to nationals. I wanted to redefine what it meant to, to, to be in an office and as an international and um, never losing sight of the country I'm in, the, the, the national officers who know more than I do because I knew more than the internationals did in Lebanon and, and, and kind of respecting the, the, the cultural insights and um, yeah, all of that. And, and that was also, I mean, I'm, you know, as a, as a budding anthropologist, you know, to this day, I think it was also just fascinating to see how some of the same issues can be perceived differently. And so how you address them and solve them are different and, and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I could say a little more about where I worked and how I worked, but really that's kind of the push that, that let me out. And, um, and it remained this, 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 like I said, it's almost nerdy, um, desire to learn about how things can be done or solved differently in different, different countries or contexts just, you know, carries me through still. We have a, a few things in common there. I'm, I'm also a biomedical engineer from the University of Iowa. <laughs> and so I, I had kind of a um, you know, convoluted path as well to, uh, to where I am today. And also I, I was born in Venezuela. My family is from Chile. And so um, you know, I, I was overseas and, uh, and I, uh, my, my dream was to come to the US and I finally did. I had a scholarship from the government. So, um, after studying biomedical engineering, I, um, I thought, you know, this is very expensive for benefiting, you know, a small number of people. And I wanted to do something sort of uh, uh, the opposite, you know, something that was a, a little cheaper, always in health, right? Cheaper, but benefiting most people. And so, you know, public health started shaping over there. Um, and, um, and when I was at Iowa, I, uh, I started in environmental engineering. Then um, I had the opportunity to work uh, with, uh, with these two professors, Lawrence Fortes and, and, and James Merchant, and they were very interested in global health. And, uh, and so I had the first opportunity, I did my PhD work in, uh, in Costa Rica uh, in uh, uh, banana plantations. And I was looking at pesticide exposure and, uh, and disease related to, uh, to pesticides. Um, and then uh, both of them recommended to me the CDC, the Epidemic Intelligence uh, Service Program, uh, which both of them were alumni from. And uh, so I, I did that. And, and then I've been in CDC since then. 
And, and I think, I guess, one more thing is um, while I was at CDC, um, originally I focused on domestic issues, but I very much wanted to work internationally. So I volunteered anytime I could to do uh, emergency refugee work uh, overseas. And so I had a, an opportunity to, to do that a few times. And, and then I moved over to, uh, to Global HIV. Over. Awesome. This is amazing. I mean, just some wonderful experiences. Um, and just to clarify for at least uh, the students who are here, um, Dr. Fortes was a professor in occupational and environmental health, and he retired um, about three years ago, very involved in global health in our college. And uh, Jim Merchant was, of course, the first dean of our College of Public Health. Um, so you, you've all touched on this a little bit, but uh, what previous jobs or degrees or other skills um, led you specifically to the path that you're on or the, the role that you're in, in now? Um, are there any things that you maybe said yes to, any unexpected opportunities that you felt really kind of opened up certain doors for you to go into global health? Um, well, for me, actually, it was French. Um... <laughs> And that's why I, I think just listening, there isn't one clear path that takes you to, to global health. I think it is uh, a desire to explore and to learn about different cultures and to use that learning and share it when you have the opportunities to different countries. I, too, always am learning and sharing um, from a different country in Africa and health centers and bringing that to Mozambique or wherever <laughs> I've had the privilege of going. Um, but uh, the French um, got me into Peace Corps. When I first applied for Peace Corps in my real fourth year at Iowa, I wasn't accepted. And then, and that's where the persistence comes from in following your dreams or hearts. In my fifth year, I was accepted. And the reason why was because the people that were before me didn't have a, in Senegal a French language skill. So they couldn't do the job, they couldn't learn the local language and learning local languages and local customs is so important. And so that opened up the opportunity for me to be accepted and be sent to Senegal where I worked in a social center in a small town and uh, began with um, actually um, cholera outbreaks. Um, that was in the early 70s when cholera was first introduced to Senegal. So, it, and I started a library where we collected fines uh, because I never returned my books on time at Iowa <laughs> and I had heavy fines. And so it was, a, it was a sustainable way of continuing the social centers after I left. So I just really learned a lot from there that I still carry through to, to this day. And um, yeah, so that's what really introduced me and, and got me into this. And then when I came back and got my MPH, I um, was fortunate enough to um, work on swine flu. And that um, has been helpful with COVID. Uh, <laughs> because I was at the county health department in Chicago, Maywood County, and worked with CDC. And that got me into immunizations, which is something that I have followed um, and worked on in Africa, polio eradication, but more importantly, the health systems development of routine um, immunizations. So um, yeah, so it's just been, um, doing um, and applying for things. Um, like I worked for three years uh, from 78 to 81 uh, on an 18 country Boston University project based in Abidjan, West Africa. And there I uh, applied for the position, but it was only open to medical doctors, but I applied anyway, thinking I had the right background <laughs> with the immunization experience in Chicago. Uh, and uh, I was accepted as the um, a person to manage what they called the sexy objective, which was the introduction, introduction of routine immunizations after the eradication of smallpox. And the CDC attempt at that time in the early 80s to eliminate measles, which we're still working on. So I, I worked very closely with WHO offices in Africa and um, with the CDC in development of programs. And um, so the opportunities that USAID and civil service has given me to 
introduce programs like integrated disease surveillance and response and collaborate with the CDC and with ministries of health has just been um, really uh, fantastic. I think, so, and uh, what I love about your story, Mary, is it touches on something that we talk about with our students a lot, which is that if you don't apply, the answer will always be no. So sometimes it's worth applying even when you're not perfectly qualified. Well, you can't be qualified, but you may not have the degree that they're looking for. <laughs> exactly. But, um, I, I would really stress that language skills are, are, are also very important. Um, in uh, Burundi, um, we're looking for uh, a senior level replacement uh, for the senior that I'm acting as in the position of, but you need to be able to speak French to relate well to the ministries of, um, to the government, to the president, to the minister of health. You're in a diplomatic position as well as being a technical person. So there's a lot of different types of skills that you need and language and um, yeah, understanding of the communities that you work with is, is really critical, over. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I don't, I've, uh, I, I don't have an easy answer to this one either, just because to be honest, if I were to be really, really honest and I'm thinking of your students, I can't even claim for a moment that I had a plan. Uh, I, I think, you know, I, I graduated and, and I looked for a job. I graduated and I, you know, I, if I had gotten, I graduated at Hopkins in 91 where there was an economic crisis, so I couldn't get a job to save my life in the US or in Canada. Um, so I had to go back to Abu Dhabi. I had to work in the private sector. Um, but then it was, and then I, you know, really wanted to leave the private sector. So I went to do a master's uh, in public health and I went to Beirut and I got into the wrong master's program. I, I got into a, a master's of engineering management, but I wanted, I wanted health. I wanted hospital administration, found myself shifting to a master's in public health. I mean, like luckily was able to petition to move. And it was literally my last course in medical anthropology where like a light bulb went off in my head going, oh my God, how have I not been doing this all along? This is it. Um, and when a light bulb went off saying that, you know, I wanted to do a PhD in this, like, you know, this is, this is, this is what I want to do next. Um, but I was honestly, I think my, uh, you know, my very first few years, to, if I were to be completely frank with, with, with everyone listening, it was just kind of survival. I was looking for a job. I would apply and, and I wasn't, I wouldn't apply to any job. So I think this is, this is where it's kind of what you really want. And, and to Mary's point, you kind of keep pushing and knocking on the door that is most interesting to you. And eventually an opportunity appears. Um, but I think the, what started happening and I, and this did play a really important role was I immediately you start forming networks, right? You start working with people and making relations and people start, you know, noticing what you're doing or remembering your curiosity or your interest or your at, at, at that time, everyone was just very impressed that I had a degree from Hopkins, even though I wasn't doing biomedical engineering. Right. But it kind of spoke to spoke to to I don't know what it spoke to. It just like rang a bell with them. And I think it, I think that's important. I think, you know, kind of carrying that, you know, a degree from University of Iowa would help. But like, you know, just something that kind of. Um, spark some interest but it was definitely then after that it became the network because then like a number of jobs that came later were people kind of saying oh you're available you know so and so is looking for someone to do this kind of job would you be interested um and that's really how the next few few jobs happened which i i feel for me those were the jobs i mean the first one was with a regional arabic ngo where we were developing um, resources in Arabic on, you know, the, the Convention of the Rights of the Child was relatively new. It was deciphering it and making it accessible to people and speaking about children's health, but speaking of it from a point of view of empowerment and participation. Um, it was all very new. It was all very exciting and very new. And like, I had no idea what I was getting into, but it was just so fascinating. And I learned so much. Um, but I mean, there was that. And then, and then, you know, went off to do my PhD and came back and found myself being offered a consultancy with Save the Children Sweden, who I had worked with in the Arabic NGO, you know, in the Arabic NGO. So, I mean, like these little kind of networks started happening and that was really started cementing um, my reputation in, 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 the, in that circle, uh, both in Lebanon and in the region and, and kind of bit by bit was helping me get closer to, well, I mean, these are all jobs I loved, but it helped me kind of continue that evolution, uh, that trajectory of other jobs and getting into them. Um, yeah, I have something really important to say that I now can't remember, but it was, um, yeah.
you could always jump in if you if you remember it. Right. Um, I'm going to let Alfredo answer this question and then we'll let Eric introduce himself. Eric is working with an international vaccine alliance right now, so understandably very busy. <laughs> Alfredo, go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I see a lot of uh, parallels in, in what you both have said so far in terms of that there isn't a straight path, uh, that you always have to sort of find a way to get yourself in, right? It's a Global health is not necessarily an easy field to get in if you decide that you want to do that, right? Um, and I think the first thing is to get experience, right? So many people don't get the job because they don't have the experience. So how do you do that? So, um, you know, my answer to that is, uh, you know, go out on a limb, uh, uh, you know, volunteer, uh, you know, try, try to find ways that you can, you know, have even a little bit of experience if you can do that through the school. Uh, in any way, it will give you a, a tremendous amount of help. Um, and also, you know, sort of put yourself in situations where you're not, when you're, where, where you're extending yourself, right? Uh, most experiences that I had, uh, particularly in the beginning overseas, um, you know, you could say I had no idea what I was going to get into. And, um, and you learn from that, right? And you have to sort of make things up on the go. Uh, you have to find resources locally and you have to find a way to do those things because uh, there isn't really a recipe or there isn't a, a, a method or a system that you can uh, you know, sort of latch on to do things. Things are maybe a little bit different today and it depends on which country you are, whether, how developed they are and so forth. But, uh, but I think there is a lot of similarities. Um, obviously, languages, it's incredibly important. So I, you know, I'm a, a native Spanish speaker. I, uh, I spoke a little bit of, uh, of French. Um, and then um, when I volunteered in, the, in CDC for emergency refugees, I went to Angola a couple of times. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't really speak Portuguese, but then, there, you know, I, I acquired the reputation at CDC. Oh, he's the one that speaks Portuguese. And so they would take me, this is why they take me for Mozambique the first time around, right? Because uh, there weren't many people that spoke Portuguese. Um, and then lastly, I think um, uh, you have to, you have to, you know, sort of get yourself uh, a, a niche, you know, and you may do this uh, over the years, you know, sort of thinking about what is it that you like to do and, and what you're good at. Um, you know, uh, analytics is one of the main things that you, that you look at in terms of public health these days uh, globally knowing how to look at data, knowing how to analyze it and display it, uh, you know, knowing how to communicate that to people or to an audience who's not, uh, you know, an epidemiologist or a statistician or, or you know, a, a, a very educated person, knowing how to, uh, you know, explain something that is uh, not necessarily very simple to, to, uh, to folks, to common folks. I think that's a, a really important piece. Um, and then also, um, you know, sort of two things that have, also been kind of key skills for me over time is uh, managing staff, you know, uh, uh, over time sort of uh, understanding, you know, again, I never had any training on this. It was just all uh, sort of self-learn, uh, you know, bigger and bigger groups of people. And, uh, and at one point it becomes um, sort of like the main thing you're doing is managing people, you know, hiring new people, uh, you know, getting people that are on the way out and, and making sure they transfer their, their knowledge. Uh, you know, making sure that, that, that everybody gets what they deserve, gets an opportunity to get improved in their, in their career path. I mean, it, it is quite a, a, a bit of a, of a handful to manage people. And, um, and then lastly, um, understanding what other people need, you know, when you're in a global setting. And I think this uh, talks about what you were saying in terms of, um, you know, the context and the culture and all of that. If you're somewhere and you are trying to help people and you don't understand exactly what it is that they want, and it's not easy in, in, in many places, you know, people are not entirely uh, sort of straightforward and open and upfront with what they need and what they want. So understanding how to get that and, uh, and how to uh, you know, turn it into a, a way that you can help people is, is, is really important. Over. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so before we get to student questions, and thank you to those of you who have submitted questions already, um, I'm just going to let Eric introduce himself really quickly. Uh, Eric, if you could just tell us a little bit about um, what you're currently doing and your current responsibilities, and then just briefly how you got into global health specifically. All right. Thank you, Sophie. And first, my apologies for being late, and uh, I'll, I'll keep trying to find a good excuse, but I don't have one. So uh, except having too many balls in the air. So my apologies to everybody. 
Um, so how did I, well, what do I do now? I uh, actually, until uh, this morning, I was a temporary staff uh, replacing a parental leave at Gavi as a health system specialist. And uh, that got me to cross the ocean uh, during a pandemic, which is a lot of fun. And uh, apparently as of this morning, I'm a permanent staff. And uh, I'm part of a small team within Gavi. Gavi is a public-private partnership. It's an alliance, but uh, as these things tend to have, there's a big alliance and then there's a smaller secretariat. The secretariat is about 300 people, give or take, based in Geneva. Most famous right now for having the COVAX facility, which is pushing the COVID vaccine to the world. I have, well, as of yesterday, I had nothing to do with it. But uh, there's, uh, there's entropy and uh, things happen in global health. So apparently I'm going to have uh, something to do with it in terms of trying to help uh, make sure that uh, uh, the scaling of uh, the COVID vaccine doesn't become totally yet another vertical program that displaces everything else as essential and needed as it is. So my job is to be um, um, an overpriced grunt worker and uh, in that uh, our team is here to kind of, we, we don't set the policy, we don't set the strategy, we don't set the direction. We're kind of a little bit of a quality control or you know, belt and suspenders to make sure that as you know, billions of dollars are being dispersed to advance immunization, that we try to advance towards uh, sustainability towards system strengthening, towards maybe one day integration. And uh, it's a lot of uh, nuts and bolts work. And as opposed to my previous job, which was much more uh, quote unquote strategic. Um, so, and it's, it's, it's interesting, I'm learning a lot. And uh, I don't know what the other question was, but you said to be short, so I'll stop now. Okay. That's right. If you could just give us a little bit about how you got into global health and maybe a bit of the career trajectory that brought you to this point, which I know is difficult because you had a very interesting career path so yeah, far. There's a lot of random elements. Uh, I started as a family physician. Well, I did some emergency care in Paris. I was an MD in France for a short while. Uh, I joined um, a humanitarian ship and then realized I was totally uh, unqualified to go uh, uh, help in uh, the destination countries, which were Africa. So I got a diploma in tropical medicine in London, uh, took a loan to do that. I don't recommend it as a career step, but you're in the States, you take loans for your studies. So. Um, and then I ended up back in Paris, and then I did a master's in public health, which was the first one ever in France. And I had developed some personal networks, uh, friends of friends of friends, in uh, West Africa, in Mauritania. Uh, I was, uh, I'll tell you this because it's a fun anecdote, but I, I applied for a job there. I was turned down because I did not have enough experience as an MD, uh, but through these acquaintances of acquaintances, I went and did my, um, uh, my research for my MPH. I went to do it there as a volunteer. I took another loan and uh, I did that. And on my last week when I was supposed to head back to France, I was, I was turned into a project director, which I did for the next four years. And then after that, I still felt vastly incompetent, which I still do to this day, to be quite honest. And so I went and got a PhD at Hopkins and I thought at least I can brag about that and, and feel better and, and, and saved years in therapy. So that's, that's about how I got into global health. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so we're going to open this up to student questions or I guess audience questions now. And um, we do have a few questions already to go. Um, so the first one comes from a student. How do you maintain cultural humility when working in other communities, especially on behalf of a foreign government or foreign institution? Um, and this is open to anybody who'd like to respond. Let me, let me well, give, give it a, a, a fresh. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just going to say that that, that, that is a, a really, really important and hard question to answer. Um, I mean, you encounter that every single day that you're working uh, overseas, right? Um, you, um, you're given a job to do, particularly if you come uh, sort of on a, uh, on a platform like I am now uh, as, a, as a government advisor, 
uh, and a donor uh, entity in, in Mozambique. Um, and um, you know, we've recently really tried to struggle to incorporate more the voices of people living with HIV in, in the activities that we do. Um, and as you can imagine, um, I mean, well, Mozambique is, is delayed de developmentally in, in many different ways, but civil society organizations in Mozambique are particularly, uh, you know, young, incipient. Um, and so um, they, uh, they struggle to, to really uh, sort of be able to voice what they want and, uh, and then to make that into a, a plan that they, uh, that they can, you know, put into practice. And of course, they don't have, you know, any of the basic things, you know, they don't have enough money to live, uh, they don't have, uh, you know, good health or good health care, uh, transportation, you know, all of those things. And so to, to get those people to work in your setting where uh, you have a, already an incredible divide between you and them and the people working in the government is really tough. Um, and so it's, a, it's an art more than, than a science. Uh, again, I think listening is, is one of the main things. You have to, you know, make the biggest effort to understand, to, to just listen to people. Uh, you may not agree with them. You may think that, that you know, what, what they're saying or they're asking for is wrong and that you have a better answer uh, or whatever. But, uh, but just to listen to people is really important. And, um, and to keep doing that, to, to, to try and, uh, and really come up with a way that uh, what, what you're proposing to do is really something that people want and is useful to them. Um, you will probably find out uh, time after time that you're trying to do the right thing, and uh, and and you know you're you're not doing you're not getting it. You're not actually giving people what they are asking for. So that's a it's a long life uh, lesson uh, that you will have to uh, uh, to learn by yourselves. <laughs> Over. Yeah. If, if I may, I'll just add one thing. I think, you know, Alfredo has these beautiful answers that I feel like I shouldn't add anything to because they're just, they're just beautiful on their own. But uh, I, I just, I just want to say that the first time I was filling out a form when I first joined UNICEF, I was really humbled by the, the sudden realization that I was now an international civil servant. It was, it, and I, and, and I, and I, you know, because, you know, English is not my first language. And so I stopped at that. I'm like, oh my goodness, I, you know, and so the kind of, and this is something I remind myself of all the time. But just to what Alfredo was saying, um, yeah, I, I, I was picturing myself in some of meetings with, with ministers or with the government and, and, and it's, it really is, um, I feel important, you know, as UNICEF, we speak for children. So I never ever compromise on the, 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 the data, right? This is what the data shows, this is where the children are. But I do kind of flip over, what would you suggest we do, as Alfredo was saying? And, and this is this is this, you know, this is a this is a tactic I use across the board because as 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 he's saying, you, you don't know that you have the best way to forward. And in fact, I think all of us uh, in, in these uh, you know, we all know that there's no there's no magic solution to a lot of these issues, right? But but you need you need to sign kind of you need the backing, you need the endorsement, and you need the insights. So I I do yeah, I completely concur with what Alfredo is saying. I would I would frequently kind of I'd be very I would push really hard on this is an indicator that cannot be ignored, but then let's, you know, what do you suggest? How should, how do you, how do you think we should address this? Yeah, if I may add the other area, um, and I know PEPFAR has been heavy with data. And, and as I said, I worked on integrated disease surveillance and response, where you look at data to prevent, you know, disease. But my experience too, and I think we touched on that earlier, is getting out into the, um, getting out of the capital cities, but getting into the communities, um, the health centers and, and meeting the people because they often have the answers. Um, and, and sometimes what I found is just being a voice at the national level for what people, um, families and um, even health staff, but the communities want to bring up to the national level, but don't have that platform to do it. And I sometimes do. So speaking for others, learning from others and using, um, their best um, recommendations to follow up on to carry out programs that meet USAID guidance and you know whatever we have to go through some of the uh, rigorous bureaucratic um, and administrative processes to do it. 
is is worthwhile and but it's really getting out of the capitals and getting into the communities and hearing and sometimes being their voice over wonderful thank you all um so the next question also comes from a student so working as global public health professionals are there any practices you have acquired through your experience or maybe specific experiences that you believe have made you better health professionals listening just just listening and you know just just being out there i i think yeah i think every i i hope every single student listening is taking an anthropology class because there's nothing more valuable than just actually listening and learning and respecting like the whole the whole the, the culture the setup the, the the microcosm but just listening every time i made a mistake it's because i wasn't listening i think in the same direction as listening to me it's uh, not developing tunnel vision as you you know as you progress in your career you you, you get better at certain things and then you know, people, you know, maybe call you an expert on this and that have never really believed the hype, but you, you, it's tempting to start believing it because there's stuff you start to know and you've seen people do mistakes that you've gone, you know, you've gone beyond. And so you start, you know, you start really believing that this is the way to do it. And uh, maybe it's the same thing as, as, as listening, but it's being intellectually curious and look, looking over your shoulder. And, and, and looking at what's happening uh, in other places and looking at other ways to frame problems and other ways to understand them. even the agenda of people, uh, you know, uh, you know, even things like corruption, you know, corruption. I mean, it's not that everything is, is, is acceptable. Some things are not acceptable, but starting to understand what's happening for that person, what's the burden of responsibility, what's happening, how can I engage person to person? And, uh, and I think that tends to make you better. And so that's listening to people and, and that's being intellectually curious and listening to your peers or listening to people you disagree with. That, that would be my take. Mm. Um, so the next question- I just add oh, go ahead, that Maha said earlier that I think is really true is also knowing that when you can't you don't have the enthusiasm or the belief that you can make you can do something that you you do get tired and sometimes burnt out and and upset with you know the corruption and things aren't moving and then you just step aside for a while and come back refreshed so i think that too is something um i know i have experienced i think everyone does just to be aware of you know it 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 takes a toll um in trying to you know, meet goals, whatever, get governments to <laughs> not be corrupt, or, you know, just seeing that people, um, that populations aren't being taken care of as you think the government should be playing the better role in. And then you have to step aside and get back and get refreshed. So I, I just wanted to reinforce that too. Yes, all excellent advice. Um, One thing, I'd, so, sorry, Sophie, yeah, One thing nope. I'd like to ask. Uh, to add and, and to go in the same direction as, as Mary maybe is, is to say that it, you know in, in my career I've you know I, I after the Hopkins uh, PhD I, I got in technical assistance so all of a sudden you had a, a, an army of NGOs that we were providing advice to I was working on sustainability capacity building so all of a sudden from my little office in the suburbs of Washington DC I, I I was starting to feel very uh, influential on some things, uh, at least from my perspective. And going back, you know, maybe stepping aside or taking a job more in the weeds, which is not good for your career, but it's good for, you know, being grounded in reality. And I would, I would put my current move, which was for personal reasons, but it's, uh, it's a little bit the same. I'm, I'm, I'm back to kind of some brass tacks and, you know, maybe my experience is still valuable, but I've got to check on stuff that usually, uh, you know, I was doing 10 years ago and not now. And I think that that brings a reality check that's kind of helpful. Absolutely. Um, so we have a question here that is somewhat similar. So I want to touch on it. Um, this uh, 
attendee asks, what are the most beneficial or useful skills that you learned during school um, that have benefited your career? And then maybe, is there anything that you wish you had learned or taken advantage of during school, um, given your current career trajectory? And we have attendees from everybody from undergraduate to PhD. So if, you know, I think at any time in your schooling is probably appropriate. Hmm. Well, I, I, um, I think I mentioned earlier, um, you know, get, get, a, get a niche, you know, get, learn some skills that, that you feel comfortable and that you like to, uh, to use. And so I think it's different for, for different people. Um, but I, I can tell you from where I said that the things that, that are most um, sought after are uh, skills in uh, information systems, in analytics, uh, you know, um, data dashboards and, and how to, you know, be, visualize information. So I think in general, I think the trend I would say is, is about how to use information in a way that's helpful, right? There is so much information out there, even in countries like Mozambique, and most of the time we don't know what to do with it because we don't know how to, you know, look at it all together and make sense of, uh, of, of what it's saying and, and how it could potentially be a solution to some of the problems that, uh, that you have. So that, that would be my advice. And I think you know, it's a really rapidly changing uh, field. Um, so you should take some courses that help you go in that direction, but, but you need to keep, uh, keep digging at it. You need to keep going while you're out and you're working, you need to uh, continue to hone your skills and, and learn some of that so that you can uh, stay current. Over. Yeah, sorry, Eric, you're gonna say something? I, I just, I, you know, I'll, I'll be very brief because I, 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 I can't stop myself from saying this, but to me, honestly, it was, it was the way of thinking. It was problem solving. So as an engineer, the way you approach a problem and, and solve it, you know, I remember, I don't remember anything from my MPH, but I remember like the process of analyzing the epidemiological spread and like, how do you, how do you follow a vector? Like it's, it's the processes that I think stuck with me a lot. Um, and there were a number of like, like I said, these little aha moments of, you know, the door opening, you know, the health belief model, you know, the, like I said, anthropology, like there's certain things there that kind of struck, but definitely the processes and the PhD, of course, was a process from beginning to end. It was, it's that exercise, I think, which it's the exercise that stays with you. It's like a muscle you build. Uh, it's not the information necessarily that I retained, but the process definitely stays with you. But I completely agree with Alfredo. I mean, I do wish I was a little more specialized in some things than others. Um, and I, and that is definitely more valuable now, but for me, it was, it was that it was, um, yeah. Well, if I can, I I would... oh, sorry, go ahead, Alfredo. Oh, just briefly, because it, it's related to what the Maha was saying, but yeah, I think it's, it's a process and a system and a muscle that you learn, but part of that muscle is also intuition, right? It's not just all about data and what the data say, but it's also about, uh, you know, what you know in the back of your head from the context you live in and the people you talk to that also give you sort of an idea of, of you know, what the big picture is and, and where you need to go. Sorry, that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. I mean, I was just going to say that certainly if I look back at, you know, going through school, I wish I had kept or built up more of the quant skills, you know, a quantitative analytic skill, because then I wouldn't have to be so nice to biostatisticians or epidemiologists for them to do the work I want to get done. So I wish I'd done that. On the other hand, sometimes when I've worked in large projects and I've seen some of our younger colleagues you know, maybe the kind of generation of the students, I can see you guys. Uh, one of the things that I've observed is that people seem to have lost like the kind of participatory. I mean, I, I, I was in Mauritania and did a lot of the participatory learning and action, you know, uh, action research, sitting on sand dunes, using, using goat droppings to analyze what are the big problems. And you learn so much by, and maybe that goes with Maha's comment about doing classes in anthropology, but not just doing the classes, going and, you know, I mean, I, I still think that the people that go through the Peace Corps gather a tremendous experience. Uh, I've, I haven't done it, but uh, I think this, this kind of grounded participatory uh, dialogic approaches are also tremendously valuable. So two sides of the coin, I guess. Um, if I can add just 
because I was a Peace Corps volunteer. <laughs> And it is the toughest job you'll ever love. And again, the one that really for me was my education and provided the basis. Yes, I wish I had uh, pursued more in epidemiology and in, because I love it and I think it's important. But um, I, I fear too, and I now just speaking to the students, I know it's a tough time to find jobs right now. And Peace Corps opened up so many doors. Um, most of the foreign service and civil servants at USAID and State Department, what is the basis for their hiring? Peace Corps. It's changed now, but I think it gives you that grounding, that understanding. Um, without taking anthropological courses, you get it. <laughs> Um, you know, um, and, uh, you know, to this day, I still speak some Wolof. It, it never leaves your heart. And um, so I guess, yeah, I'm putting in a plug of careers are important, jobs paying off student loans. I was privileged because I had the U.S. Public Health Service scholarship when I went to Illinois. So I've had no loans. And at that time, it was damn cheap, <laughs> but, um, but not putting off what you think, you know, can pursue or, or further um, your interest in life um, is, is something to not to try to jump into a job for a job, but to really follow, um, you know, do some volunteer work, um, whatever it may be. I think that is probably one of the best things that you can do outside of and in addition to your school-based learning. Over. Perfect. So we actually have a question that is, I think gets at the other side of Peace Corps, the more personal side. Um, so what is it like to live in a different country that might have different customs or ways of life than what you're used to? And how do you adjust and continue to do the activities you enjoy? So exciting. Yeah. It's so exciting. <laughs> just, just, just embrace it. Just like, you know, just like, just walk in, walk, walk in open hearted. You just embrace it. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm just going to say that. I'm, I know someone will have more excited, but I am always so excited to go to someone new. And it's, it's not, as, as Mary said earlier, it's really not easy all the time. Uh, it's, uh, it's a culture shock. And I have always gotten sick the first week arriving somewhere new. I've actually gotten physically ill um every time but then loved it you know i it's just just completely you know that, that was just a shock to the system but the rest of me still wanted to go um yeah that was just so exciting i i, I would say be bold be ignorant and bold <laughs> because it will pay off yeah and to add you just have a community of of friends of people that um you know uh, I, I don't know, my mother would come and visit me in Washington and say, Mary, you have no friends here. And I'm saying, sure, I have lots of friends. They just happen to be in the Congo and Mauritania and Senegal and Africa, but I'm in Washington, so I get to see them a lot. So it just opens up, um, again, a network of people and, and people that, um, it, just a different perspective on life, I think, um, and where you fit. Uh, and so, um, yeah, to go out and explore and enjoy and, and be open to uh, to change to different things. Um, you can't get any better food than in Senegal or Ethiopia. So <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, it, it, it's just yeah. marvelous. And, and, and just look at the people that are on this phone call now that we have a network of, of people that we know. Um, so it, it's a world of opportunity. Yeah, I, I had a, an advantage on that sense because I've always liked to eat weird foods. I like to eat anything that's different than that I've never tried before. So uh, that's a, that's a, that's an example of <laughs> of embracing the cultures that you're. At. But you know, seriously, I, I mean, beyond that, I think it, uh, my colleagues have said it right. It's just um, that's the fun part. You know, when you go to another place, um, you know, I, I would hope that you go there because it's different and you're curious and you. And you want to see what it's like and you want to you know understand what makes those people tick and you want to understand you know what they want and they need and and they you know they love or not love i mean that's uh, that's uh, really part of the fun and yes it will not be easy um you know you are a foreigner um you will be a foreigner where you are and um you know there's uh, there's many ways in which you won't fit in 
So you have to get used to um, to being looked at in a different way and being, you know, sort of the under the microscope and uh, you know all of those things. But you know um, that also helps you grow in different ways. You know, it makes you it makes you um, I don't know. It makes you uh, accepting of whatever you bring to the world. <laughs> Oh, I, I wanted to, I just want to add, sorry, I don't know, if, I just want to add one thing to this, to that point also is that, you know, in the, in the last 10 years, I've been relocating as a family with my, with my husband and, 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 uh, well, in the last five years with my daughter. So that also kind of, I mean, I want to raise a couple of things here that, that became a whole different bag of tricks because I can't, I can no longer be as bold and adventurous as uh, like on my own. It's different kind of perspectives of, of factoring everyone in, but at the same time, you know, there's, I'm, I'm not having to choose between work and family. We, we, we travel, we, we look at it as a family, it's a family decision. And, um, and I think that also kind of, I mean, for those of you who are considering that with a family that also kind of helps because we are always, we have, you know, we're grounded in, in, in the three of us in our little family. So we're kind of, we, we help each other explore new places, but we kind of can come back and be grounded in, in the three of us together. So I just want to share that. Well, maybe just one point on this. I think it's easier to move a six months old than a teenager. Yeah. So, you know, the six months old, if mommy and daddy are happy, especially mommy, six months old is happy. Yeah. Uh, teenager, you've got a whole different battle. I'll have, to, I'll have to call you in a few years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So we are um, just coming up on the at the end of our session. So and we have quite a few questions that we were not able to get to. Uh, I think what I'll do for those of you who did not get your questions answered, um, if it's all right with our panelists, I think I'll send them to you in an email. And maybe um, if you want to answer them, however briefly, um, I can send them out to our attendees after this. Um, so to kind of finish off our um, session today, um, if you could just tell us um, one piece of advice you have for current students who might be interested in pursuing a career in global health, or just generally are about to graduate and head off um, into professional practice, um, what is one piece of advice you might offer? I think we've brought up a couple ones already. One is volunteer, just get experience, just get out there and do it. But another one that I wanted to mention is get a mentor, get somebody who, um, you know, can help you out, figure out how to, how to, you know, get into global health. Over. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I just, uh, as Alfredo said, we've mentioned a lot of them. I would just kind of say, just be humble. Just really just be humble. Take on whatever, you know, if you... If, if you want to just go out and get it, just just be humble. Take on take on whatever grunt work or whatever work is 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 out there because you will learn. Okay. Just be, you know, be clear on on what you want out of it. Um, if you if you want to be in a new place and learn a new country, then it's actually better that you have a simple task to do that you can do well and focus on something else. But just be humble with with with. And frankly, this the humility I kind of carry with me still. Just be humble at all times uh, when you're out there. Yeah, um, I, I think um, being humble, but no job should be beneath you and yeah. you can grow from and learn from. So I, I think too, what we look for in, in hiring and looking at is being a team player. You're not above or below anyone else. And, and um, like a program management assistant someday can become um, you know, the head of an office. So uh, dream big. Um, but act, um, I guess, you know, what do we say, um, locally and, um, you know, invest your time and invest it in understanding and being flexible and good with people. And so just to add my two bits, I would say, and, and this may be controversial, but I feel like you know, I mean, I started in this job a little while back and uh, it was kind of this international development, and global development. And I kind of feel like our institutions of international and global development are going to be here to stay. But the entire logic of international development, there's a history to it, which is kind of has lived its days. And so, but human social development, public health, uh, you know, social justice, uh, these things are valid wherever you are. And by and large, you know, maybe 30, 40 years ago, 
there was a, a strong comparative advantage to people that came out with a Western, you know, industrialized uh, nation education. And this may be controversial. I mean, uh, but they, they, they maybe if you looked at the average, there might have been, you know, something that maybe a guy like me showing up in Mauritania having an added value, maybe. But if you look at the world, the way it's evolving, my colleagues come from the South and North, you know, and I'll just admit, I'd like to work in West Africa again because I love the place. I want to go back to Palestine because I love the place. I like tea. And, uh, and, and, but there's the issues of public health, the issue of global, you know, development. They're as accurate, acute in France and in the States as they are everywhere now. There are still differences, right? But, uh, but by and large, um, you know, look at what you're doing with and for people. As a, as a global health person and, and not so much this international um, constructed hierarchy somehow. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us and thank you to our attendees for taking the time. This is the last week of the semester, so our students and faculty are very busy. Um, there will be a recording of this session available on UI Capture for um, University of Iowa folks uh, later today. And then I will also send out the answers, um, the responses to the questions that we didn't get to answer in person. Um, but again, thank you all for taking the time. It's been really wonderful hearing your stories. Good thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Please you know, shot me in the first part so we don't see I was late. You know, it was, I'm glad you were able to join us when you could. This was, I mean, it was really wonderful. Yes, thank you guys. I've been sitting here laughing. You had great comments and